Hi, Jessup. Whoa, this thing's on. You guys awake? You guys need to be awake, right? This is, the, uh, this is a, a desperate, dire time in the semester, isn't it, for you all? Let's give you guys a round of applause for making it to this point, okay? Can we do that for you guys? Dude. I've been, I've been in your shoes before. When I was in Christian college, uh, this is the time of the year when everything but the right things sounded like a good thing. Isn't that right? And so, I mean, if someone's got a Frisbee, someone's got an Xbox game, someone's got a, a great idea, anything you can do to drop homework and run and begin to have fun and procrastinate is a great idea here. So I can see some of you all went the pajama route today to chapel. So it's that time of year, right? And like you're all out of bed, you show up to class and you're gonna make it through. You're doing the math. What is it going to take for me to finish this race so I can get to summer, so I can survive? And, and that's um, understandable, but I have an invitation for you this morning. And it's an invitation from um, some experience that I've had in my own life uh, that hopefully will be encouraging to you. Because at this time when motivation is in short supply, it's all the more important uh, to know how to buckle down in life. Because seasons like this will come plentiful in your life. And uh, this, the story for me uh, that uh, begins with a little practical wisdom came from an unexpected place. And uh, it's going to end us today um, in uh, Matthew chapter 7. So if you're, you have your Bibles or an app, you can pull out your Bible if you want to in Matthew chapter 7. But um, uh, go ahead, turn there now, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and as we look into God's Word today, we're going to see some truth uh, that's going to help us as we, as we seek to just do just what we said, to go deeper. I love that your, your chapel theme is deeper, right? Because settling for a shallow life is something that none of us would ever say is our goal. But it, oftentimes our actions reveal uh, that we don't care really where we end up. And uh, on a particular day for me, about 10 years ago, uh, that was made crystal clear. I was standing with my toes in the sand and the California sun on my face, and I was facing west, and I was looking at the beauty and the majesty of the Pacific Ocean. And I was, on one part, exhilarated and excited, and the other part, I was scared out of my mind because we were about to go boogie boarding at Huntington Beach uh, for the very first time. Any boogie boarders in the house? Oh, woo, yay. And everyone's, everyone thinks it's lame because boogie boarding is like surfing for wusses, right? And so, like, if you can't quite stand up on a surfboard, if you're afraid to actually, you know, try to get up on something, boogie boarding's awesome because all you have to do is kind of like wade out there a little ways and you got your flotation device. When a wave comes, you know, you, you can still be touching the ground. You can just kind of jump and flop and kick and wee, you know, all of a sudden it's an adventure. And that's how I roll, okay? Like, surfing is way too hard. I tried it one time and, and it did not work out well for me. And so here I was. And, and I, have a, I have a deep, dark secret to confess to you guys. I'm not from here, okay? I'm actually, I hail from a little, a little place in the Midwest called Missouri, all right? Any, uh, any Mid Midwesterners in the house, all right? And so uh, many of you guys don't know any geography east of the Rocky Mountains, and we forgive you for that. When you say, Missouri, that must be in the south, right? Next to Louisiana? Nope. <laughs> Smack dab in the middle, the gateway to the west is in, is in Missouri. And if you're a local there, you might call it Missouri. And if you're a Californian who moves there, like my wife was when we got married, then you just call it misery. <laughs> because it is humid and, and is suffocating in the summertime. And in the wintertime, it is bitter cold and freezing. And there is no fun to be had there. And so uh, as a California guy who had escaped, or as a, now a California guy, as a Missouri kid who has escaped to California, and it was my first summer, I was doing a full-time ministry at a church just down the road. We had taken our youth group there to Huntington Beach, and it was extended rec time here at a Christ in Youth Conference. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a MOVE Conference. It's a really life-changing thing. It's where I committed my life to ministry. But, but at this time, I stood there with a couple of dumb high school kids, and we contemplated our existence for about two seconds, and then rushed into the, the Huntington Beach uh, waves. And the waves that day were so big. I mean, I'm a big guy. I'm like six foot three. And I was out there, and I was jumping for all I was worth with my little wussy boogie board to keep my head above water, to keep from, from being sunk by these like four foot and, and growing waves. And, and I, came, I had to come to Jesus moment. I may mean, not walk out of this ocean this day. And so I got to got to hold on for dear life. And, and as I was out there, I quickly found that, that there was some exhilaration we found when we attempt things that are beyond us, right? Many of you guys know this experience when you step into the unknown, something that's way too big, uh, way too scary than you can do. And for me, I had no business being out there, but I found as I got in my position and I did my, woo, my boogie board flop and I caught my first wave. You ever have those moments where you feel like you're in a movie? You guys ever have that? Like a soundtrack starts playing in your head? Like, dun, 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 dun. 
da, 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 you know, like you know, Indiana Jones. For me, when I'm in the water, I get, I get this. It's, it's Pipeline. It's an old surf rock tune. It goes, and I'm going, you know, cowabunga, man. And I'm, I'm, I'm riding this giant wave. My legs are flopping around behind me like a sock monkey. And I'm going, and, and I ride this wave all the way into shore, and I like beach like a seal in all my joy. Ah, oh, I make it. And I stand up, and I squeal with glee, and I go running back into the Pacific Ocean to repeat it because I was at a four-hour rental, and I had some stuff to get done. And so time after time after time, I went out there and rode wave after wave in with, with these friends of ours from the youth group. And, and, and in a while, I don't know if you, have you ever been in the Pacific Ocean? It's freezing, okay? They don't show that on Saved by the Bell in high school, okay? It is cold in that water. And, and four hours later, my hands are blue, my feet are numb, and I'm, I'm trying to, to walk, you know, out of this water because we've got to get back to our group. And, and the funniest thing happened because when I got out of the water that day, I walked, and, and I was about to go to where I left my towel, my flip-flops, and my wallet, and it was, it was shocking to me because I walked out of the water, and all my stuff was gone. I was like, what happened? And our group, you know, the people who were there just on looking, enjoying the sunny day, they were gone, and, and for just a second, I was really fearful that I'd been, I'd been left there. Someone had stolen my stuff, and the group had took, taken off, and here I am, stranded forever in Huntington Beach. I guess it's not too bad of a thing, and so... <laughs> But, but, but I, I scanned around my, you know, I'm, I'm a guy, okay, I watch Bear Grylls, I know how to survive in the wild, okay? So I stop and I, sur- I scan my surroundings for a moment and I realize, man, that surf shop where I rented the boogie board, which is right here, it's not there anymore. And that lifeguard stand that I walked by to make sure I wouldn't die on the way out here, that's gone too. And I looked and sure enough, about half a mile down the beach, all that stuff is there. And in all of my zeal and all my excitement for boogie boarding that day, I had not realized that, that slowly but surely, every single time I was catching a wave, every single time I was, I was kicking back out in the current, that I was being carried someplace different from where I started. When I walked out of the, those waves and was expecting to find, you know, the, the welcoming high fives of our group, I, I was faced with a long and thawing walk down the beach to where our, our, our tribe was. And I, I had this sensation. I, I asked myself this question, how did I get here? And I don't know if that's ever, ever happened in your life before, that you've, you've emerged from whatever you've been doing, whatever fun you've been having, or whatever the thing you were intensely focused on. And you ask yourself that question, how did I get here? And, and if you haven't asked yourself that question for a while, I think this morning, God would really want you to be considering that in your life, is how did you get here to where you are? And is this place the place where God is, is intending for you to be? Or have you gotten here by drifting? So much of life is, is about intentionality, and, and so oftentimes we get so caught up in what's going on that, that we miss it. And, and I've, I've asked myself that question before, how did I get here? How did I get in a three-month relationship that was all wrong from the beginning? Have you been there before? You're like, how long have we been together? What, what's this anniversary? Like, this was supposed to last three dates, and I've been in this thing for three months, or maybe for some of you, three years. And you go, how did I get here? It happened elsewhere in my life at a time, and I'm feeling the heartburn of regret again as I ask myself, how did I get here? Telling these little white lies to people that I care about so much to preserve my pride and to protect myself from consequences. I sat in in a church office in Missouri uh, where I had done some ministry prior to coming here back to California again, (laughs) the promised land. I went back for a time in the wilderness, and then God brought us back here, thankfully. But but five years into that that journey, I was sitting in my office, and I was asking myself, how did I get here? How did I get to this place in ministry of comfort and security where where I was content to just kind of go through the motions and to keep the gifts that God had given me buried And those talents, which I knew I was called to use for his glory, to keep them someplace safe where I wouldn't have to risk failure. How did I get here? How did you get to where you are right now? Have you felt this way before? How did I get here? How could I have given up my virginity in in such a stupid and predictable way? How, How did I get here? How could I have wandered back to this sin that I've left so many times? I know the path. And here I am again in this place of conviction. How did I get here? How could I be failing this class when I should be passing it so easily? Amen? You guys are Jessup students. I know you're better than that, but let's be real. Or how, did, how about this one? This one's, this one's for real, okay? Freshman in the house, okay? Buckle up because the, the William Jessup cafeteria could come back to bite you, okay? Okay? Because how did the freshman 15 turn into William Jessup 40? Amen? Anyone in the house say amen? 
I mean, come on, throw in a cereal bar, a waffle bar, and all the food you can eat. I come up here, we're right across the freeway at our church. I come up here and, and I feast sparingly because the food is really good here and I got to watch it lest I come out with a mountain of soft serve, you know, and a bellyache. And so, so how do we get to these places here? Maybe, and maybe, seriously, you've made mistakes before in your life. Maybe you've returned to the vomit of your past sin like we so often do. Maybe you've chosen foolish paths and you've wasted your time or you've poorly stewarded your health. How do we get to this place? And, and in there, we don't usually feel a lot of joy and warmth, do we? In that place when you feel, when you look around and you feel disappointed, like you're not where you ought to be, there's some feelings of condemnation there in that place. There's a, there's a feeling of loss, like, like hope deferred, because we know that God has intended something so much better, but here we are, and, and the enemy enters into that time to grind you down and condemn you, to say there is no hope, there is no other path, this is where you deserve to be, you screw up, you failure. And we know that the words of God would never say that to us, but, but when we get to those places, like, like I was that day, when your teeth are chattering and, and you're frozen to the core because of the frigid waters you've been in, the only path is to walk back down the beach to where you wanted to begin to start over with God. And God graciously invites us to walk with Jesus back to that place and beyond that place and to learn from our past and to lean on his wisdom. And, and I survived that day 10 years ago to boogie board again, but the lessons that I've learned since then are still sinking in. I've still not been able to apply them perfectly. And if we, if we look again at God's word and God's truth, we'll find that there's something important for us to catch here because if you're not careful, young adult in this house, if you're not careful, if you're not watchful and diligent, you can find yourself wasting the best of you in frivolous pursuits. It's so sad to see the, the potential that, that a freshman has coming into this place, uh, into any place of education, zealous for life, free for the first time to, to make decisions for their future. But you find after a few years of, of distraction and disappointment or maybe just laziness and bad habits that, that this person who had such great hopes and dreams is disappointed because drifting can steal away your life. And this generation, your generation, is adrift in some very, very scary ways. You find yourself lost because you're, you're without a, a church to call home. Many of you have come here from faraway places, and Jessup is, is indeed a holy huddle. It's a hill where you can come and find encouragement. But, but the church family that I know Jessup is so uh, excited to see you plugged into is something that many of you all leave to the wayside. When push comes to shove, those people you need when summertime comes to support and encourage you, you don't know where to go because you have no church family. For some of you, you have no, no, no family at all, no support, no home life to encourage you in your journey. Some of you have no meaningful friendships to lean on. You're adrift. You, you have no success right now finding the dream job. You have no direction in life where to go. And, and you feel that you have no intimacy with God. And that's an awful feeling. If you look at what are the waters that, that this generation is adrift on, that, that we are, are tempted into, we're adrift on a sea of Netflix. Amen? <laughs> Man, Netflix is the devil. I mean, man, 18 episodes of anything at one time should be forbidden, but man, it's right there. Why not? Keep clicking. You know, finals will wait, okay? You know, you, it's, it's horrible. I, I digress. But you're adrift in free time. Sometimes the more options we have, the, the more paralyzed we are. You're adrift in overload or procrastination. You're adrift in, in video games or distractions, and you, you just get adrift in, in lethargy, just that feeling of blah, I don't know what to do, and, and apathy, and I, I don't really care. Today doesn't matter, I'll wait for tomorrow. But when you focus on that surviving day-to-day, -day, just the waves that are going on in the world around you, you lose sight of, of where you're headed. You frequently end up in, in some frustrating places. Read with me, if you would, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, because Jesus tells us there must be a better way, that the way that, we're, that what we're experiencing, that disappointment, it comes with the territory of living in this world, but Jesus has a better path for us. Matthew 7, verse 13 says this. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter, it, enter by it are many. Jesus says that you, you followers of mine, come through the narrow gate because here's the other option. There is a wide open gate there, there is a highway that's paved, and it's called the path of least resistance in this world. And it's pretty easy because you can do nothing and find yourself there. 
in, in this world around us, the, the lure of the world is, is don't try. I mean, don't, don't, don't look. Don't try to you know, see a, a path. Don't, don't deny yourself, your impulses, your urges. I mean, embrace those things and follow your heart. And, you know, you know do, what, do what feels right and good to you in your flesh. And in that easy path, the path that says, come, come along. You bring, bring your bags with you. Bring whatever you want. You can load up your trailers. The, the path is wide. Let's go. Bring your addictions. Bring your habits. And bring all that stuff, bring all that stuff from your past that you love to roll around in, the guilt, the self-loathing. Bring all that with you down this path. And it's okay. Eventually, you're going to find a happy ending here. There's no bag limits. There's no weight restrictions. You can, you can just load up your junk and come on along. And this choose-your-own-adventure spirituality that the world has that's prescribing all around you in the political correct nature that we live in today. And that define your own path discipleship is dangerous. And Jesus says, look out. He says, if the gate is that wide and the way is that easy, that there's no call for sacrifice, if there's no truth to face and come to grips with and embrace, then beware, you may be on the path to destruction. Because whatever feels good and looks good is not always good. All is not as it seems in this world. And Jesus says that there's an undeniable connection then because because the choices we make to walk the broad path or to choose the narrow path will determine the outcome of our life. And we as humans, we have this propensity for choosing paths that do not lead in the direction that we ultimately want to go. We, We strive to be here, but our feet lead us there. What is that about? Jesus says, let's read on in verse 14. Jesus says again, enter by the narrow gate, verse 14, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. You go, Ugh. It's like the opposite message you need to hear right now, right? Oh, great, you know, the, the, we, want, we want a broad road. We want a paved road. We want that freeway where, where things come easy to us. And Jesus says, the road is out there, but it is not my path. Jesus says, if you want to come and follow me, he says, here's the deal. The gate is narrow. The way is hard. It literally means that it's not, a, it's not a wide path, it's a small path. You can't fit all your junk on this path and walk along with it. You have to leave what you have behind and follow. If you've ever been on a deer path before in the woods, you've been hiking before and you think it's a good idea to kind of, you know, diverge from the path, to take the path less traveled, I've done that before. And man, it's hard because, you know, backpacks don't fit in those places. And the things that we'd like to carry along to provide for ourselves, man, there's no room for them when we walk this path because the path is literally narrow. It's pressing in. And and it's difficult for us. And because of that, because it's obscured from the eye seeking self, only a few find it because only a few wake up from the stupor around them to walk the path of Jesus. And this path, the question is, what is this path? Because if there's one path that leads to life and one path that leads to death, Don't we desperately need to seek that with all we have? And the answer to the question that Jesus gives us is not a what, what is that path? The answer to the question is a who. Because the who is Jesus. He says in John 14, 6, you know, describing the the way that he's come to save the world, he says, you want to know the way to the Father? He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He said, you want to get to the Father? There's only one way. It's through me. And that path of walking and following me is is not that burdensome. He says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light at one point in time. But why do we find in so many different circumstances throngs of people following Jesus, but then at the end of his ministry, only a few remaining there to celebrate his resurrection, as we will in just a few weeks, and and to sacrifice their life to follow him? It's because those people knew that to follow Jesus on the narrow path, to find his life, meant that they needed to embrace their death. Jesus in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, you might pencil this down. This is a verse that you ought to have locked into your mainframe as you walk through life. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says this, and he said to all, because the invitation's for everybody, everyone who would hear Jesus' voice, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Says so everyone's invited, everyone's included. You can come and join me on this path. I died that you could participate in this life that I have for you. But it's not a life that you get to pick for yourself. It's a life of laying in down and surrendering all that you have with me. There's only one road that we can travel in this life and be with Jesus. And I have to ask you, where are you at right now? What path are you on? 
And I, it's not my, my role or my job to come in here to make us question our salvation today, but I, I, will, I will ask you this, is where is your conviction? Where is the sum of your investment? Where, where is that road taking you? Because we have to come to grips with it if we ever hope to embrace a deeper life with God. Far be it from us to hear chapel message after chapel message and and class after class and to walk out unchanged and untransformed on the path of least resistance because narrow is the road and the invitation calls us to action. Paul, the apostle, he he came face to face with this in his life. You remember Paul? Paul the murderer? Paul the the zealot for the the Jewish religion? Paul in, in Philippians chapter three is regaling the church with the tale. He says, there's a path that I was on and it was a path of pride. It's a path that I was successful. In the world's eyes, there was no one who could beat me. A Hebrew of Hebrews, he calls himself. The Jewiest Jew, okay? And and, and Paul says, all that stuff which I put my stock in, my identity in, he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever paths he'd been pursuing before, he said, I can't take this stuff with me And follow Jesus, because I have to die to these things. He says that, indeed, I count everything as loss compared uh, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Check this out. For his sake, for the sake of Jesus, the way, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Check it out, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, may share in the sufferings of Christ, the the difficult road, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He goes on, he says these, these encouraging words, not that I've already obtained all this or already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He's purchased me. He's pardoned me. He's appointed me for life. And I press on to take hold of that life, to not drift with the world down the path of least resistance, but to walk with Jesus step by step. He says, verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. He's not arrived But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Look through the book of Proverbs sometime at all the instances Solomon gives us of the way of the foolish, that the fool is wise in his own eyes. The fool ignores wisdom as she calls out in the streets and and they wander away like, like an ox to the slaughter into all sorts of wickedness and sin, adultery, lying, murder. He says, that's the way the fool. But Paul says, if you're mature, think of it this way. Think of it like Christ. And if in anything you think otherwise, he says, God will reveal that also to you. If you've got the spirit inside you, calibrating your walk in life, he will make it clear to you. He says in verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. Hold true. Stay the course. See the goal and remain there. There's a, a saying in the world that insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. I've thought about that a lot recently because I've been trying to study people who've gone before, people who, who have walked a path and found success, found a, a life, found a, a depth with Christ that I myself am longing for. And insanity is doing the same actions day after day and still hoping that I might find some change because here's what we hope inadvertently. We hope that we can find depth by accident. I mean, by doing the same thing every day, which is pretty much ignoring everything that Jesus wants us to do, maybe, pursue our own path, we, we still assume somehow, because we, because we long for or intend or, or desire to have depth with Christ, that somehow by osmosis it will be imparted to us. But, but there's a truth that when we sow to the Spirit, we reap the things of God. But when we sow to the flesh, and we invest in those things of this world, that that is what we reap. We reap the flesh. Solomon in his wisdom in Ecclesiastes would say that, that we, we, we reap the wind. It's a chasing after the wind when we invest in, in the pursuits of this world. So what do we do? I have an encouragement for you because this one phrase, it's an axiom from a, a man that I respect greatly. He was my first mentor, really, uh, a hero of mine, and, and it was in a book that I read his words. His name's Andy Stanley, and he's basically the man. If you're a pastoral ministry major or you have any you know, leadership aspirations in the world, 
read and listen to Andy Stanley because he's a man who has taken great principles of truth and applied them to Christian leadership and, and, and to the, the truth of Scripture. And there's a, a phrase I have to give you that's changed my life. It's, it's jacked my life, truthfully, because it explains so much about the world around me. And it's this. It says, is your direction, not your intentions, that determine your destination? It's your direction the path you're traveling down that determines your destination, not your intentions. And here's where we can fool ourselves because we have so many good intentions. I mean, I have a good intention every day. I think, man, today's the day I'm going to eat right and be fit, baby. Oh, man, I intend that this is going to happen, okay? I have some intentions. I'm going to go deeper with God. I'm intending. I'm going to be in shape. I think a lot of fit thoughts in my life, a lot of fit thoughts. Yeah. I, I intend to get eight hours of sleep a night. I, I intend to maintain rich friendships with a handful of my favorite people. True, true confession, when I walk onto campus, I oftentimes hate it because I see someone every time I walk onto campus that makes me feel uh, uh, the, the weight of this. I see Nick Breitbart sitting right over here. And so Nick is a buddy of mine from back in the day. And, and Nick is a guy that he looks, in, he looks a lot like Jesus, if you know Nick. And every time, I, every time I'm on this campus, we, and we just had this experience on Wednesday, I see Nick across the cafeteria go, hey, hey, you know, hey, man, we should get some coffee sometime, you know, like, we, we do a little gesture, you know, we do a little dance, but here's the reality, I love Nick. If Nick were my best friend, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. <laughs> but, but I'm not doing anything to pursue a friendship with Nick. Nick, I love you, but you know it's true. And so, <laughs> but, but here's the deal, is that we have intentions. I have intentions to call my grandma, <laughs> I don't call my grandma. I, I, have, I have intentions, you know, to, to, to invest in my wife. I, I have an intentions to do a lot of great things in life. But here's, here's the deal, is that the reality is I'm not walking a path to take hold of those things. And, and how much more true is it of our life with Jesus? J Jesus loves that you're positively oriented towards him in your heart. Jesus loves that you wear a bracelet that says you're a Christian. Jesus loves that you have so many books about him in a Bible that gets cracked occasionally. Jesus loves that, it, that sometimes when you're driving along and you're frustrated, that you decide to talk to him a little bit. But here's the deal is that, that all our intentions, all our great thoughts about Jesus, that is, they're not the same thing as a life that's, that's directed towards him, actions that are walking a path of discipleship, because that's what a disciple is. It's not a person who claims uh, an affiliation. It's not a fan who shows up with a T-shirt on a, a, a disciple is a follower, and the word means apprentice. It means someone that, that you are following to take on their life, to pattern your life after them. So how, do, how do we do that? How do we even we do that? We look in the Gospels, and Jesus is the most inspirational figure in the world, but how do we take on his life? Well, Jesus invites us down a path of imitation, and, and i got to say, that there is a lot of great um, encouragement you get here on campus. You have some of the most amazing teachers and leaders, administrators here on this campus in the area. When I look around, I look at a guy like uh, I look at a guy like Dennis Nichols, who I worked on staff with for a time. Dennis Nichols is a juggernaut of a man. <laughs> He's a barrel-chested beast, and he walks with a tenderness and an intensity that I think looks a lot like Jesus. And I see Dennis, and I go, man, I want I want a life like his. I want to walk like him. I look around, I see, I see David Timms, the, the new Australian on the block, right? And, and I sat on my laptop in, in my basement in Missouri and, and was schooled in Christian leadership uh, in his graduate program through Hope International University, and you guys are lucky to have him here now. And I was struck by, without ever even seeing him or meeting him, his heart for God and, and his, his dependence on the Holy Spirit. He took education and he continually tied it back into a, a submission to Jesus Christ and a life with him. And I could go on and on. I could name these people here that, that you are so blessed to sit under. And, and some of the greatest lessons you're going to learn in this season of life may not be from your textbooks or from the notes you take in class. They might be from the people you see who look a lot like Jesus. And when you look at their life, I guarantee that if you were to ask them that there's a pattern of behavior, there's choices and responses and habits behind the scenes that, it, that show a life dedicated down a path of following God. And we could do well to learn from their example. And it's funny, in the end of Philippians, in um, chapter 3, verse 17, at the end of that section we just described, we usually think, here's the goal. Man, think great thoughts about Jesus and run hard. And I think if I was reading those words, I'd say, Paul, I, if I was the first audience, I'd say, I, I know you run hard, Paul, but how do I run hard? How do I follow after Jesus? And in verse 17, he gives us a clue. He says, 
In chapter 3, verse 17, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. He says in 1 Corinthians, he, he takes it a step further. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And, and my encouragement to you is as you're walking this path of growth, as you're walking this path of discipleship, that if there's a person who looks and loves like Jesus, that, that you maybe get in line behind them. You find their pattern of living. You find their life. That's what the rabbis were there for. As they called disciples along, the disciples would come to learn to do exactly what the rabbi did. And as you see those people, I mean, ask them. Lean deeply into their knowledge of Christ, into the, the pattern of their life. And if you don't know how to follow Jesus, then follow someone who's following him. It's right and good to do so. Because Paul says, I learned this from Jesus, and I'm passing it on to Timothy. He encourages Timothy, Timothy, you know my pattern of living, pass it on. So look to those people around you who are loving and embracing Jesus and, and, and understand this, is that God is for you in this journey. There's a lot of condemnation that we could put on ourselves, but, but more than anything, more than the stuff we focus on, the works that you're trying to achieve right now, the great things of God, the plans that you have, we get so focused on that. I don't have the internship. I don't have the job. I, I'm wanting to be a transformational leader for Christ in my community, but, but I don't know the path to get there. I don't know how to take hold of those things. Well, I would encourage you to focus less on, on the accolade, on the goal, on, on the benchmark, and focus more on your character and the journey. Because the question isn't, what have you done? The question that Jesus is most concerned with is, who are you becoming? And are you becoming a person who looks and loves more and more like him each day? And, and I know that God is calling you towards that path. And, and the invitation he has today is to learn and love. Would you make your life a classroom where you can be an apprentice of Christ? As you leave this place today, as you go out into the workforce, you seniors, would you continue to look for people to, to model your life after as you follow Christ, that you would have a life worthy of imitation as you call people to follow you as you follow Christ. And this is what God has for us. He has a life, and he's longing to impart it to you. But will you walk the road to get there? And I think that Netflix is good and nice, but it probably won't help you make it to the path of Christ. And though the path of least resistance feels good and procrastination is great, I, I think that there's some discipline and some intentionality to be found. And those things, when we follow Christ, are not burdens, they're invitations. And so as I pray for you right now, I'm just going to pray for your heart, because those who are mature, it says, will think in this way. They'll think of, of running the race with perseverance, as Paul says, and I long for you to have that heart, that mind of Christ. And I know that God is more than capable through his spirit to guide you there. So let's pray as we depart and as you uh, walk out this day on a journey uh, to follow him. God, thank you so much for your invitation, God, to know life in Christ. I thank you that we're not looking for, for GPS directions, God, to a road. We're looking for a life we're looking for the, your life, God, breaking forth your kingdom in this world around us. And Jesus in this moment is longing to, to meet us here with all of his grace and all of his power God, and all of his mercy and wisdom to lead us down this path. Would your spirit guide us and when we walk out of this place, God, not content with drifting in this world. God, would you catch us as we drift and would you draw our minds back to you. God, draw our feet back to the path, God, that embraces you, God, and walks the relationship road, God, of knowing Christ more and more, that we truly might grow deeper. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you all. Pursue him in your studies and have a great rest of your semester.